On today's show, Donovan Mitchell had his introductory press conference as a member of the Cleveland Cavaliers. We'll react to what he said, what Kobe Altman said, and more. I want to thank you, by the way, for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every day. Remember, we are free and, and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. All right, the music you heard on the way in is from our friends at Astro Radio. Check them out on Spotify or Apple Music. I'm Chris Manning, covering the Cavs and the NBA at large for places like Diamond Up Rocks and Espations for the Sword. Evan Damerel, my co-host, covers the Cavs and the Cleveland sports scene at large for Meta's right down Euclid. Producer Jake Stevens is not with us behind the virtual glass today, but as always, he is producing... This episode, Evan Donovan Mitchell had his introductory press conference. Indeed. I, I I think that the with the interesting part of it for me in in getting to listen, you were there, I was not, is what he had to say both in his session at Rock and Works Fieldhouse and then what he did in the one on one he did with Brian Windhorst at uh, ESPN, which you can watch on, on YouTube right now. The, him saying but for this is to take a part of a quote that he had quote all summer. I didn't say much, but for me, once Rudy Gobert got traded, I kind of saw the writing on the wall. I think we all did. I think we understood we had a good run. I kind of had a feeling that, that I was going to get moved. I thought it was New York. I'm not going to lie to you all who doesn't want to be home next to their mom, but it ends up being Cleveland. He's saying all the right things about it. Seems genuinely very excited about who he's going to play with. And it seems like he was really just, expecting some kind of trade for himself this summer. And I, I, it's interesting to see him just kind of talk about this and process it because it is still so fresh, kind of. You know, we didn't say, like, a ton that was descriptive. Some of the best stuff he said was about, like, his LeBron fandom and things. But his reaction to it feels, like, very human to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it felt human. It felt raw. It felt real. And, I mean, I, I'm kind of writing – I'm still working on my story about this for write down Euclid, but – Let's be frank, he hasn't been home, which for him was a small village outside of New York City proper, but he grew up around the Mets. He grew up in Queens. His dad was a player, director of player personnel for the Mets, and that's his favorite baseball team. But he hasn't really been in New York since before high school. Like He went to high school in Connecticut. He went to college at Louisville. He went to play for the Jazz for several seasons, and now he's in Cleveland. So you have to empathize with it even like as a guy who is still in his early 20s he still has his best years probably ahead of him because his contract will run until he's in his 30s and maybe he can sign in new york then who knows what's going to happen in three four years time so you empathize with the human aspect of it because you can understand where he's coming from where he says yeah who wouldn't want to be home next to their mom like who wouldn't want to be playing with like you know his child favorite childhood team which is the knicks or you know being back in queens or those areas too so you can go to mets games and things like that as well where you can kind of just be around what you grew up with and kind of what you haven't been truly near in quite some time. So it does make you nostalgic for home. It, may, it makes you empathize with that aspect. Like it's kind of like a kid going to college and maybe being a little homesick for a while or a guy who, or anyone who maybe starts a career far away from home when they get out of college. So like, you're just like, yeah, I really want to go home for a bit and relax and, and just enjoy life there. So you empathize with it. But like you said at the top, there wasn't much to glean from it when he was kind of talking about them, the New York aspect was definitely interesting. I think him opening up with the wind horse and really saying that, Hey, I was pretty sure I was going to be a New York Nick, but Kobe often said it himself when things kind of changed, the Cavs were waiting in the wings this entire time. They've been having discussions about trading for Donovan Mitchell. And I think it'd you know, be remiss of any NBA team not to kind of hit up the jazz and see what the asking price is. But when New York waffled, especially after they extended it, signed RJ Barrett to an extension, the Cavs were able then to swoop in. Cause I think, just based on reporting, the Jazz were just fed up with the Knicks going back and forth with them on this, and they were ready to talk shop with somebody else. The Cavs had a pretty attractive offer, and that's where it kind of comes down to the brass tacks. And thankfully, he does. Mitchell doesn't seem too upset that he's a Cavalier. The the things he gave, a, I think the the most interesting answer to me that he gave was when he was asked any reason to believe that the Cavs can't compete for a title right away. 
and this is part of the quote, he said, yes, there's no reason. We have to go out there and do the work. On paper, we look scary. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what we do in the gym. We had a good run today. And we've got to continue to have good work. So I can't sit here and tell you, and this is another quote, yes, we're a championship team. We have to go out there and prove it every night. I know we're going to have good months and good weeks and good days. We're going to have bad weeks and bad days. But for us, if we continue to put in the nut, in the work night in and night out and continue to put that effort in the right ways, we might do something. I think the tone, Evan, of this press conference more than, you know, there's obviously like the getting the Mitchell kind of breaking the ice for the media side of it, him kind of um, taking in this first first time. It was obviously like a much bigger kind of presentation that we've seen in the past because it was at the arena and not at the practice facility. Having been at like introductory post-trade press conferences at the practice facility, those feel much more like claustrophobic. This felt like an event with like John Michael moderating it and all of this stuff. Like it was a spectacle, right? Like even just listening back to it, it feels like a, a bigger kind of presentation. The tone of this from, I think, Altman, I think, you know, less so from Bickerstaff because he didn't say as much. And, and for Mitchell, mm -hmm. is it like, I think everyone sort of understands that, like, even if this isn't an immediate title contention thing, this trade comes with expectations and, and yeah. things you now have to accomplish. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I asked Donovan about this towards the end of the press conference because I framed it with how Ricky Rubio really pushed Darius Garland last year, and Donovan was heaping praise on Rubio. He called he he shared that he called him Jesus back when Rubio had the long yeah hair, which made yeah me he uh, there's a video that he posted on Instagram the other day when they were in um uh when they were in Nashville training and oh. there's a the caption of it was had Jesus and it's like hit Ru Rubio walking towards him maybe the first time they'd seen each other since the trade or whatever but it was yeah he I that that there were. You can that relationship, tell that, it, it's real well, because like Mitchell yeah. shared, like he, he went to Spain to visit Ricky even after Ricky wasn't with the jazz anymore. So yeah. And there, we should note, I touched on this in an episode coming Friday, but there's like a little, there are little Donovan Mitchell, Bickerstaff alluded to this, but there are a little like a jazz to Cleveland connections where Mitchell knows people. This isn't like he's coming into a situation where he doesn't mm -hmm. know anyone. You have to sell him whole cloth. Like there are guys he already knows on the coaching staff he talked about spending a lot of the summer with Darius. They both played in in Miami for for a bit during a during some proams and stuff. Like he he came in the same draft class as Jared Allen. Like there is even though it is not guys he knows fully and like knows mm -hmm. the same way he did like Royce O'Neal or Gobert or whomever in Utah. There is like a familiarity at least a little bit kind of at the the baseline level of this. Yeah, I mean, he played with Halu Neto. He played with Ricky Rubio. You mentioned the coaches. I think Antonio Lang is like the biggest coach on Cleveland's coaching staff that he has familiarity with. I'm sure he, like you said, he spent a lot of time with Darius. Like, there's a lot of connections here. Like you said, there's a lot of vignettes to kind of peek into how, like, Donovan really isn't a fish out of water when it comes to coming to Cleveland. And I think that certainly helps the Cavs quite a bit. If I think we had more time, I'd ask him, like, hey, you've been spending a lot of time with Darius this summer. Do you think that's going to translate to a little bit more on court chemistry and a little bit of ease with one another because you guys have just been playing a lot of pickup together. You guys have been doing runs together. I mean, and back to my point, like when I said, what are you going to do to push this Cavs team to become more than just a playing team to become a playoff team and kind of get the ball rolling from there to hopefully become a championship caliber squad. And he said, we have to learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable, which I think is a good way to put it. And there's going to be a lot of growing pains. I think it's not going to be an instant success on the beginning of the season. Like Mitchell also went up to the fact that he just hasn't been a very good defensive player to this point in his career, but like he's oh, going we, to. We, we are going to, we are going to talk about that quote because I was like the Leonardo DiCaprio meme seeing that. <laughs> okay. We'll put a pin on that then, but yes. Like you said, he doesn't seem like a fish out of water. He did all the Cleveland cliches where he wore a Browns hat coming off the, the plane. Um, it's been reported um, and that he will be throwing out the first pitch against the White Sox in the next few days for the Guardians. Like He's going to embrace being a part of Cleveland in as many ways possible, and like this is just a bucket list way to do it. But I think, again, like there was like the concerns about him kind of longing to be back with the Knicks. Like, what if this goes sideways? Or what if this doesn't work out exactly as Cleveland planned? Like, I think the Cavs having a little bit of this safety net with those vignettes, they gave us a gleam to with just his relationship with the organization outside of just the trade itself um, certainly helps Cleveland's cause in acquiring an all-star like Mitchell and a player who probably raises and heightens expectations quite a bit. But also, um, it, it's, it's interesting because... 
when he talked about how like hey i'm a new york kid like how did you become a Cavs fan like i think the, it's such an obvious answer but he said lebron james and like there's the famous picture of him wearing the lebron jersey growing up as a kid like there's when well, he was cool... at the, and he was at the decision like he's yeah, in he, the background yeah, of the was, decision yeah. yeah he was in the background of the decision like that's that's insane like that 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 whole moment's coming full circle right now where like lebron left and then donovan mitchell who happened to be there is now playing for the team lebron dish for but donovan did disclose i think ben axelrod wrote a story about this or somebody but he did a write-up on this ben axelrod did and it's like mitchell disclosed that he wanted lebron to go to the heat either way um i don't know i i, I don't really have the concerns like he was asked the basic questions like well the weather sucks in cleveland and mitchell's like puts a positive spin on it saying i like cold weather and i dress better in fall attire which my brother in christ same i look better in fall wear because it covers up the uh the curves i got going here but um i just i don't really have the concerns that a lot of people do with him not wanting to be here because like you said there's groundwork established within the organization and the fact that he's kind of doing and saying all the right things in the less than 24 hours he's actually been here is pretty reassuring and it's a good foundation to build upon for maybe the next several seasons he's with cleveland it's all yeah that's also that's a kobe Altman problem we'll talk about him later uh but that this is yep. not that is not a problem for us to solve sir There's all right a after reason this... why we're hosting a podcast and not in a front office that's right. YouTubing is hard, though. All right, after the break, we're going to talk more about Donovan Mitchell, what he had to say. But first, going to tell everyone about our friends at BetOnline. BetOnline.net is your number one source for your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Find all of the latest football league developments, game matchup news, podcasts, and more, including every game coming up this week on, on all the slates. BetOnline is your, also your continued source for your sports wagering information, including live betting, eSports, and scores. It is also the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. For instance, Evan Mobley is plus 1,600 to win Defensive Player of the Year. The Cavs over-under, meanwhile, is set at 46 and a half after the Donovan Mitchell trade. That's bet online where the game starts. Go check them out today. All right, back here in Lockdown Cabs. Evan Damrell's with me. Before we get into it, I want to tell you about the NBA top 50 most viable players coming from Locked On and Bet Online. Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Giannis Antetokounmpo. I don't know why two time MVP Nikola Jokic isn't there, but he should be. Which NBA player moves the betting line the most this season? Locked On and the Bet Online Odds Makers present the NBA Top 50 Most Viable Players starting on September 19th. That is Monday. Find it on the Locked On. Find it on Locked On NBA wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Might be some Cavs in that Top 50. That's say, all we're gonna say. Say a quick aside. I uh, I I had a spicy take about one of the Cavs players being much better than one of the higher ranked Cavs players on that list. So hope people enjoy it. Yeah, Evan uh, advocated for Jetty Osmond in the I top advocated 50. for Colin Sexton being better than Donovan Mitchell, like my mentions were saying today. Well, that's why you don't read your mentions, my brother. Um, okay. Oh, I don't read so, them. People just send them to me like, uh, like fandom's a hell of a drug. This, yeah, this is, this, this is bad for your brain. Bad for your brain, brother. All right. Uh, the other, there's two other things I want to touch on from what Mitchell had to say. He got asked what he thinks he brings, and I think this is sort of like part of the, the argument of why you do this aside from the skill. And he said, the first thing he says is experience. He says, Court, I think it's experience. I think that's one thing I definitely provide off the jump. Being able to use my scoring and find find my ways to create plays and get guys open shots and let Darius do what he does, Karis do what he does, and be able to be a decoy as well over, there over in the corner and let them get open lanes. I, You know, I they talked. he talked about this, and then... Kobe Allman talked about this. Mm -hmm. They they kept kind of he hit it and then Kobe hit it a couple times about his experience and his him playing in playoff games. And I think the other thing I think that feels maybe something we didn't talk about enough in the initial analysis of the trade, but it's very much now kind of seems appealing if we're thinking about this from a Cavs perspective. Mitchell just has even though he hasn't, you know, made a conference finals or made the finals yet, like he has gone and done real stuff in the playoffs oh, yeah. in big six moments at a level no Cav has yet. I, I that seems in talking through this and in hearing them talk about it, that seems to be one of the appealing things uh, about bringing in Mitchell at this point in time. Yeah, I, I really do think 
because you you especially noticed it when things were getting tight for the Cavs down the stretch last season. There were a lot of things going against them in terms of just injuries and just unfortunate stuff hitting them at the worst possible times. But Darius Garland really hit the nail on the head when they had a bad loss to the Pistons before he just kind of said, I don't know what you want me to say. Like, we haven't been here before. And then Jared Allen expressed similar sentiments where, yes, he's been there with Brooklyn, but like only his experience. And it was like Kevin Love. And then I guess technically Jetty Osmond and Karis Levert, that locker room were like the only yeah, like, like Jetty, Jetty was and on Rubio, the, we, who was we, in Spain we, at that we, point. I like, there's and something Rondo. we had. The, the, well, the thing, well, the, the, the thing we forget about. Jetty Osmond is on the 2018 finals team. Yeah, he uh, he played minutes in 20, the 2018 finals, if I remember correctly. At least in the East finals at one point, too, just because the Cavs were grasping at straws at points. But that, that's, that's, that's many but years it's just, ago. But it's just like that, that's, that's how thin the, the resume is. Like, this group is just really starting, and Mitchell yeah, is they're, like... They're the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and green. And Mitchell, he kind of joked about it because I think Tom Withers asked him about it. Like, he's 26 years old. He's in a similar vein to Jared Allen where... He fits into this young nucleus in the quote-unquote timeline the Cavs are trying to establish, but he's one of the more established players on this young core, like Jared Allen, but he has a much more impressive resume than Allen because Mitchell has a propensity to become one of the biggest players on the biggest stages, where his playoff numbers are absolutely bonkers, and he's more than comfortable with taking over in situations when things are tight. And kind of providing you a shot in a bucket when you really need it when the offense box down. And that's exactly what the Cavs needed last year. And sure, they had a to an extent in Colin Sexton, but they're getting like the absolute peak of what the Cavs wanted to self-actualize in Colin Sexton through Donovan Mitchell. And yeah, the experience factor is just a big part of this where you understand why Cleveland made this trade because it lines up in a lot of different ways. But I think having a guy who has really been in the trenches before in playoff situations because the playoffs are a different beast entirely than the regular season. Um, just really helps a lot, especially when you're a team who is trying to kind of take that next step to become like a legitimate presence in the Eastern Conference, which is a very good conference these days. Yes. The other thing I think the quote that I will be, I think kind of coming back to is like a touch point of, of his season, oh touch point of what he's going to be. I, him talking about using his length and athletic ability to keep guys in front, um, I think him saying like he definitely has to improve on that and kind of he said this to Wendy as well. It's just like he wasn't happy, I think, with his performance in the playoffs. And he also saying like JB is going to hold us accountable for that. Like I like I was going back and like reading also in the last, since they the Cavs acquired him, like reading some of his scouting reports out of Louisville and and listening to some some stuff on that just to kind of refresh, okay, what was, like, the framework of Mitchell coming into the league before he became what he's sort of been, which is, like, this offensive dynamo? He was considered, like, a pretty good defensive prospect. Yeah. It's and because of that wingspan. Yeah. I am, like, very curious to see, like, if the if you read between, like, what he said and then what he said to, to Winhorst, I almost it feels like you reboot in between the lines and it's like okay like I I understand that like it's time to put up or shut up on the defensive end a little bit and like there I I absolutely do believe that if there's like one thing I feel like I understand about Bickerstaff as a coach is that he's gonna like hold you accountable for giving a darn on the defensive end of the he, floor. He has JB Bickerstaff has zero patience if you don't at least provide some semblance of effort on the defensive side of the ball. That's why. Other than the erratic shooting, why Jetty Osmond really got put in the doghouse at times uh, over the last two seasons or so. So I, yeah. I agree with you. I also think the quote that'll stick with me is, I believe um, Danny Cunningham asked about this, where like he played alongside Mitchell, played alongside Rudy Gobert, who is arguably one of the greatest room protectors of all time. And he's like, now he has not the same, but something quite formidable in Mobley and Allen, and Mitchell just clips, hey, the more the merrier, right? So I think... I don't think you're going to get, like, perfect defense from Mitchell. I think you're going to get effort, like you said, but there's just... I think this time, this being this in the league for this long, like, I think a lot of teams maybe figure out some of your weaknesses and ticks and deficiencies on defense, and it'll be interesting because the Cavs are really loaded offensively, too. Like, they have Garland. They have year two Mobley. Jared Allen is very good on offense. Is like a... Uh, just a wide receiver option for the quarterbacks that are in their backcourt. Um, maybe the Cavs don't need to ask as much out of Mitchell offensively where it allows him to exec exert more energy on the defensive side of the ball instead. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. That's an interesting thing that we'll have to watch unfold because J.B. Bickerstaff 
probably cannot put Donovan Mitchell in the doghouse and just refuse to play him if he doesn't play defense. Yeah, so that's that's like the the crux of this, and this isn't something we can like I think spend a ton of time talking through because it's like speculative so and yeah. like kind of a nonsense thing to dive into without like think it happening. But I think like that is the di- the difference between like having to call out Donovan Mitchell for his defense is that Donovan Mitchell is like a superstar all star making lots of money that you give up a lot of picks for that is like very important to the future of the franchise. Jetty Osmond is like a fine serviceable NBA player. He's not Donovan Mitchell, and like they're how you handle the differences of that is sort of one of the keys of I think how the best teams run, right? Like this the the most famous Cleveland related example I would just say is Tyron Lou like repeatedly calling out LeBron James and the roots of the title and, and as long as he was in Cleveland, right? Like that only really worked because of that. And then like if you go to like the Lakers teams the last couple of years, one of the things they, that really came through was like before he got fought, in the year they won the title in particular, Vogel was very, very hard on his stars about providing on defense and contributing on defense and, and that was key to it. And that's that's key to I think the the buy in you get and the the level of respect you have um with your coach. All right, one more break. Talk about what Kobe Alban had to say in a rare media availability session. We'll talk about that after this. All right, last segment on Lockdown Cavs. Evan, what did you make of the Kobe Altman uh, what th- what he had to say. I mean, I'm glad he acknowledged that Judas Ogalskis tragedy. I mean, at the top, yeah. of thoughts and prayers well, with the Ogalskis family. We, let's let's circle back to the Z thing at the very end because that's like its own little thing that we we're not gonna like. That's like not a breakdown thing, but let's talk about that at yeah. at the very okay. end. Okay, okay, okay. And other than that, I think him being fully transparent and. It gives you a glimpse into kind of how this regime under Altman has worked is they're very opportunistic when it comes to these upgrade trades. Like the Jared Allen trade initially, it was probably going to have Jared Allen going to Houston, the James Harden going to Brooklyn. And then the Rockets rebuffed at that saying like, hey, we don't really want to one pay Jared Allen because we're playing with Christian Wood, paying Christian Wood. And two, we don't necessarily see the fit that at least reported they don't see the fit between Wood and Allen overall, and now Wood's a member of the Mavericks, so they have Sengun, which I guess is great for them. But um, the Cavs took an advantage of this because this is a player that they admired. Uh, Kobe said the same about Mitchell that he did say about Allen as well. It's like this is a guy that they've admired from afar for a while, and an opportunity presented itself for them to take advantage of it, and they swooped in. And I think that you can draw a lot of parallels with that too, with just how these negotiations with the Knicks went on forever and how the Knicks were kind of very bold and brash about their tactics in trying to acquire Donovan Mitchell by like showing up to a playoff game and everything else. But um, other than that, I just think what Altman had to say, just like saying like he doesn't regret having to make this type of payment because I think it is a fair question. Like you gave up a young prospect in Ochai Abaji, you gave up a guy with a lot of uncertainty, but something you do know he can provide in Colin Sexton and Larry Markkinen, who made that three big lineup and at least the two seven-footers work and a lot of picks. I mean, like, that's fair to question that. And Altman was uh, true in his convictions. He stood his ground and said, like, yeah, no, that's it. That's the price you have to pay if you want to go get a star caliber player. And he said, we believe that Mitchell is the type of player that can kind of push us over the edge a little bit and kind of get us to where we need to be. And that's where I really glean from a lot of it is he's being honest about that. Yeah, I I think I would not go as far to say like fully transparent because I don't think he's ever going to be. Oh, no, he's not fully uh, transparent, but you can glean certain things. You're like, okay, this is starting to add up with how like maybe Kobe operate, operates as a Pobo slash GM slash authoritative figure in an NBA front office. I appreciate you trying to make Pobo happy, even though I just it never quite like clicks in my head. Because it's just like so, like the whole that whole title is just President of Basketball mouthful. Operations is a mouthful and it sucks to type, so I type Pobo a lot. Yeah, just Pobo just sounds like like a kind of like a seems like it'd be like a sandwich or something. Um, well, Po Boy is a sandwich. I know. I'm just saying it sounds like never mind. I, I know. Go ahead, buddy. Okay. The other, the other, th- I think the hitting on like the opportunistic part of it is right because I think if we look at the biggest trades we've seen. I think the Allen trade is obviously one. The other one actually weirdly being Andre Drummond because that came out of nowhere and it was like, hey, Andre Drummond's like kind of just available and you get him for a second round pick and the Cavs were sort of in a very weird spot at that point. And they were just like, yeah, sure, we'll do this. Like it just kind of happened, right? And then they get Jared Allen and um, it kind of changed where they were going in that sense. Mm -hmm. But like 
<laughs> like that is just the reality of how he's worked. And there's obviously trades that don't fit that framework um, based on just the track record and how long he's been around at this point. But like the the most impactful th- moves we've seen Kobe Altman do, aside from like drafting Darius Garland, drafting of Mobley, which are more straightforward things, the moves where he's gone out and made an acquisition are very under the radar very sort of lurking and even in the case of Drummond which like didn't work out ultimately like mm-hmm. but they was a it was under like they make it seems like Evan when I think about how I th- it seems like Altman approaches bigger tr- approaches bigger trades so, like last year like they kind of the Levert thing kind of dragged out for a while the the Rondo trade was like a very well actually let's lump the Rubio trade into this as well because if you look at the four big trades I think he's made the Rubio trade kind of came out of nowhere Jared Allen. You're really missing a really big, two big trades right now. But go ahead. Well, okay, but like the what? Are we talking post LeBron? I'm talking post LeBron because the one in 2018 is like a different reality. Say the Kyrie trade and then the roster yes explosion he did. Those are those are those are like a yeah. He's under a different set of rules at that point, and like those are just like Kobe Altman part one. This is like the the real Kobe Altman is sort of like almost like what we've seen since. But the mm-hmm. Rubio trade, the Allen trade, the Mitchell trade, and the Drummond trade. All of them were either like not talked about at all until they happened or like very, very, very lightly sort of floating out there in the ether in, in the case of Donovan Mitchell. Yeah. They are very just sort of poking around. And then I think when they – and it seems like what they do is they have – when they, at least in how they sell things, they usually have very clear reasons for doing them. The Allen trade was like, here's a really good player we can get that this other team doesn't want for some reason. Let's just give up a first that won't be as good as this player and get him. Drummond was a second round pick. 48 minutes of elite center play. <laughs> Still the dumbest thing he's ever said. Um, Drummond was a second round pick. You could have, it certainly was like, didn't work out, but like, it was a second round pick, whatever. Mitchell, it's like, hey, let's go get an all-star who, like, we're probably not going to get in free agency. Rubio was like, we want this one specific thing, a leader who can handle the ball. Let's go get him and and take what it gets to get him. They're very direct. He's very direct, and the whole front office seems very direct in kind of having clear reasons for making certain moves. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. I think, like I said, opportunistic is one avenue of it. I think having a clear indication of maybe – Knowing who the quote unquote untouchables are, I think in any NBA sphere, like no player is truly untouchable depending on who, like, you know, is available in trade talks. But like Donovan Mitchell touched on it, where he was more excited that he found out that Evan Mobley wasn't traded, Jared Allen wasn't traded, who is a guy that I possibly floated in my mind that Utah said, like, hey, we want Jared Allen if you want Donovan Mitchell. Like, they didn't trade him, they didn't trade Darius, they didn't trade, he was excited for Karis Levert. Like, he was excited for a lot of the guys the Cavs didn't trade. And I think that in its of itself is important to note. But like you said, when the Cavs see a clear need and fit, they like to evaluate the situation because the Colin Sexton injury was an interesting example where the Cavs didn't necessarily overreact to the situation and say, okay, we need to go out and go get another scoring guard. They eventually got that in Karis LeVert just because Ricky Rubio went down and that's more of a clear indicator of it where if you look at Kevin Pangos, you're like, oh my god, this guy cannot play 15, 20, 25 minutes as a backup point guard. So they went out and got Rajon Rondo, but they're like, well, Rondo is kind of, you know, running on fumes at this point, so we still need that scoring punch that Rubio gave us from another world, so they went out and got Karis LeVert. So, like, the Cavs are logical in their decisions and it's kind of easy like when you look at them after the fact it's easy to kind of connect the dots and find a bit of a through line of what they're trying to do with their trades and how they kind of do things they are an organization who operates with their cards close to the vest they don't really share details a lot of stuff does not leak out of this Cavs organization whatsoever but like you said it was kind of always in the ether that the Cavs were at least exploring trading for Donovan Mitchell again if a player like Donovan Mitchell becomes available it's remiss of any team not to I mean the Lakers were linked to him and the Lakers could not offer anything to get Donovan Mitchell realistically but there's ways to go about this of course and I think the Cavs just kind of being open opportunities to find ways to level up because This was touched on the press conference that Cleveland isn't a glamour market, not at all in the slightest. They've built through the draft. They've drafted intelligently. They've hit on a lot of their first-round picks with the jury still being out on Isaac Okoro at this point, but I feel confident in Isaac Okoro's growth enough. Um, So they have to find ways, like you said, where they 
will not outright get players like Donovan Mitchell or, or who is considered a top 20 player by some, including our sponsor, but online that um, will not realistically sign with Cleveland in free agency unless like LeBron happened to be here. Like that's the only reasonable path. And that's more so LeBron using his pull, his clout, his power to recruit star players to come play with him instead. Let's end on the seven. Um, well, one other Mitchell thing, and then we'll hit the, the somber note on, on Z really quick. I'll just kind of tell people what, what happened there. Um, do, do do Can we take Donovan Mitchell wearing a hat with the elf on it that he's pro-elf? I didn't know this was such a contentious thing that, like, there's the helmet, the elf, and the dog. Like, who cares? But, yeah, I guess it's cool. Well, are, are you pro-elf? I like Brownie the Elf, sure. I mean, if it makes you happy. Like, it tripped me up last weekend when I was watching the Bengals game, and... The Bengals' new hats have the orange helmet with the black stripes on it, and from a distance, it looks like they're wearing Browns hats. So, I think the elf is more of a unique indicator, but it is what it is. If it makes you happy as a fan, I'm not going to sit here and rate on your parade. But it's 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 nostalgic, and as one Don Draper said, it's it's poetic. It gives you a feeling of longing for the past. Yep, I'm pro elf. Uh, my wife not into the elf. She thinks it's stupid. She's afraid of clowns too, so that's true. That is true. So okay, go hand um, hand with each other. Somber note: uh, People may have seen this. This broke late on September thirteenth uh, via. I first saw. I first saw this from uh, a text my father-in-law sent me from a link at our, our friends at WKYC. Jennifer Galskis, the wife of former Cavs center Jennifer Galskis, uh, passed away at the age of fifty years old. Um, don't know a ton, I guess. Evan, I know Kobe Allman addressed this. What did what did Allman have to say? He just said the thoughts and prayers, the, the organization's thoughts and prayers, and he was encouraging those in the audience just to keep their thoughts with the Ogalskis family because it's Z and his two sons. It's the right way to go about it. Like you said, we don't know what happened, and I frankly don't think it's any of our business to know what happened. This is It's, it's tragic, and my advice to you guys is, 50 is far too young. I think it's just tragic when anyone has to pass away. But if you're listening, check in on your parents or your loved ones and make sure they're doing okay. Because I think that's the first thing I did when I heard the news selfishly is check in on my mom and dad because they're in their 50s. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be it for us today. Uh, we will be back on Friday. David Ramil from Lockdown Heat is coming through to talk with me about the Eastern Conference and the bloodbath that is the Eastern Conference because... Um, Holy crap, the East has a lot of good teams and a lot of teams with reasons to really maximize next year in some way, shape, or form. So we hope you tune in for that. He also, um, if you listen to the end of that show, I had a take on Evan Mobley that he was like, he, he I kind of dug into me a little bit, and I, I appreciated that. So um, David's great. Check that out. All right, now for your second listen, go check out the Altman Pro Football Preview 2022. That's an eight episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NFL season. The local team experts of the Lockdown Podcast Network and Odyssey NFL Insiders all combined into one ultimate NFL preview. Search for Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get podcasts. I'm Chris. That's Evan. Donovan Mitchell has made his Cleveland Cavaliers official media appearance for the first time. Many more and what's going to be a lot of fun for us to cover here on the pod. We hope you tune in. Everyone, be well. Thank you.